Hi everybody, welcome to our Cake Foo Master series. We are really happy to be here today and I'm, I'm glad that you guys are all here with us. Uh, I, I know that we uh, bring these trainings to you and it's it's a lot of fun and I you know it's it's been so fun to see all of the the excitement that that comes from from cake food and I know last week we had our 50th training so this is 51 so this is just so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, think I like I said last week thank you but thanks again you guys you guys are awesome uh, okay, so to get started, I wanted to introduce our trainer today. It, uh, we have Elisa Strauss. She is super talented, super fun, super cute. <laughs> so welcome, Elisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're so glad to have you. Um, we will, um, uh, I wanted to let you guys know, again, uh, before we get started, there's the chat box on the right. Go ahead and chat amongst yourselves over there. If you have any technical questions, you can ask them there. Down below here is an ask a question box. Uh, that's where you're going to ask all of your questions to Elisa throughout the training. So make sure that you ask your questions because that's why, you know, that's what we're here for. That's why it's live. So uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Uh, so Elisa, we're going to talk about you a little bit. Uh, uh -oh. where, you're, where you're from, where you've come from, where you're going, how you got here, <laughs> all of that. Oh, so goodness. yeah. Okay. So you. Were you born in New York? I, I have, yes. Um, as my brother likes to tell me, my older brother, I was born in the Bronx, New York, which you may know is famous for the Bronx Zoo. So for many years, I actually, <laughs> I was born in the zoo. But um, no, I primarily grew up in a suburb of New York. Um, and then I went to college just north of New York City at Vassar College. And then I went to pastry school in New York City. So it's kind of funny because I don't really think of myself as a New Yorker, but I really am. <laughs> that all sounds like it to me. <laughs> I can't deny it. I can't deny it. And now I'm in Manhattan um, of New York City and I had a cake shop for over a decade, if I could say that. Um, wow. and it was a duplex and uh, a real commercial kitchen and studio and uh, workspace. And then actually after having um, my two kids, two young ones, um, I actually just work out of a studio now where I primarily teach and I teach at the culinary schools and obviously I'm teaching on Craftsy which has been fun and I'm going later on this year to Canada to teach so I'm doing a lot of stuff but um, I'm not as centered in my one bakery space. That's really, really awesome. So, okay, so when you started out, uh, you you actually didn't, uh, you went to Vassar, mm -hmm. and you, you weren't doing pastry then or culinary. No, then. no, was, I, um, right, no, I was an art major, um, studio art, so that comprised of a lot of, you know, art history, but a lot of um, painting, drawing, sculpture, all that kind of stuff, um, and a lot of other liberal arts classes from, you know, anthropology and um, psychology and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I did do um, one semester, we say abroad, but it was in Chicago um, at the Art Institute, and that was amazing because it just... This all relates to cake because I took fiber arts and textile design and color, which I think is the best class any cake designer can take. Um, any Anything with color theory is amazing. So, um, and then I finished up at Vassar and um, I always had a love of baking. I always, with my grandma when I was a little girl, she made tons of cookies and, you know, I always loved baking anything um, and so that all kind of came together uh, after college because even though I was working in fashion I was a textile designer it all dealt with design and color and running a business which is really what I do um, so it all just came together in confetti cakes that's really awesome that's super cool so um, when you uh, when you learned how to do cake decorating I, I know that I, I've heard a lot of people say that culinary school is really good for teaching you, you know, the basics and the science behind baking, things like, like that, but not a lot of decorating. So Absolutely. I would did, say, yeah. 
Go ahead. Where do you, where did you get your your base for decorating? Did you just you know try? Yeah, well, did you take classes? yeah. Yeah, two things. So I definitely, you know, always just love to bake and I always love to draw. So, you know, the art end of it always, I think, is probably more important. I mean, if you think of there are many cake designers out there that never went to pastry school. To, um, I believe Sylvia Weinstock never went either, but, you know, they're known in the field and it's just, yeah. you know, collect was a designer as well and so mm -hmm. um, when people ask me do I need to go to culinary school you know my first answer is no you don't need to go but I do think it if you can go it's great because of a few reasons one is it exposes you to the industry you know when you're home just working on cakes all you know is what you know and you're not learning from anyone else or their experience. Um, it also gives you the tools just like a liberal arts college education. It may not teach you a vocation, but it teaches you how to think and speak. So pastry school for me did that. I feel confident that I can look at any recipe even if I've never made it before, and I know what they're talking about, how to convert measurements and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, pastry school's really good. Plus, I have to say, I love going to my pastry school because it has such a great alumni network. So, you know, when I was starting out and opening my commercial space and I wasn't sure about health regulations or you know, just different people to talk to. So that's mm -hmm. a reason to go a cake designer, do you really need to go? No, absolutely not. And in fact, before I went to pastry school, I even had my own website. So I had already started doing cakes for people. And I had also taken just a few classes um, in the city at a place called the New School. And that was just taught by a woman who's, you know, a pretty well-known cake designer in New York City that taught me how to make sugar flowers and just talked about the process. Awesome. Well, cool. And I have to say that one of the best tools that has taught me about cake decorating has just been reading other cake books, you know, cake decorating books. Mm -hmm. I just love it. Um, and, you know, even though we have social media now and, you know, the world is a lot closer, there's nothing that I like better than looking at someone else's, you know, cake decorating book and seeing how they do things and how they approach things. And I've just, I, I mean, I've taught myself a lot just by looking at other people's work. Yeah. Well, you no, books are really good because you you know that you someone has spent a lot of time getting it just right. Oh my you know, goodness! So yeah, and you have have written a couple of books. You want to talk yeah. about you want to talk about the books that you have? Sure. Um, I I did two books. Uh, one was the Confetti Cakes Cookbook, which kind of was a general overview of my bakery and some recipes um, and you know it has cookies, cupcakes, mini cakes and sculpted cakes and each chapter goes from easiest to hardest because one of the things that's been so difficult is being able to reach the amount of people I wanted to reach like I you know whether I was featured on a morning show or the Food Network people wanted a piece of confetti cakes and I'm not able to go anywhere, everywhere, I should say, anywhere. <laughs> but it was like Freudian slip with little children. Um, I'm not able to go everywhere. And so, um, you know, this was a nice way to be able to share our recipes that people loved. Um, and also someone who's just starting out, it can teach you the basics of how to make a sugar cookie or someone who wanted to make a sculpted you know, sushi platter, um, it gives them that. So uh, that was the first book. And then the second book, which I think the title kind of confuses people, it's Confetti Cakes for Kids. But it's not for kids to make the cakes. It's, um, although my three and a half year old loves to help me in the kitchen. Um, they always not as, do. <laughs> yes, not as neat as I would like her to be, but um, <laughs> I have to remember she's three. Uh, but yeah, the, and so that's more like kid themes, which I have to say I've done so many birthday cakes for 30 year olds that have, you know, strawberry shortcake or glow worms or you know things that really my child wouldn't even know about so and that too I mean I love that book especially because it's the second book so anytime you do anything it's like making a recipe for the second time you're even 
that much better. Yeah. Um, and Amelia, what you start to say is like, oh, you pour your heart and soul into these yeah. books. You go over them. I mean, I don't think the average person realizes, aside from the recipe testing, how much work goes into books and just, mm -hmm. you know, the, the editing and the, you know, the thought process and making sure that no matter what your skill level is, that you can make it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the, I, I know that, you know, a lot of people put a lot of work into, you know, their, their websites, their videos, their blogs. I, I mean, I know I do. <laughs> but, you know, but a book that's published, you know, you have to go through it over and over and over and over again just to make sure that it's, it's perfect. So, yeah, and it, yeah. You know, and it lives on forever. I mean, in our first book, we did all the recipes, we tested all the recipes, and then the printer, you know, changed one of the, the amounts of flour. So then we had, oh, no. you know, in the first printing, the wrong flour amount, which, you know, if you have a recipe and that's one of the five ingredients, uh -huh. the, the cookie, <laughs> right? So I had a lot of people, you know, calling me and emailing me and I felt awful. And then, you know, luckily the book has been now, I think it's in its sixth or seventh printing. Oh, nice which is so nice, but, you know, luckily it's corrected. So whenever anyone calls me, I say, well, which printing do you have? Because you don't have the first, first edition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, and and you have two little ones, yes. right? Yeah, so yeah. How, how do, I, I know that there are a lot of moms out there listening right now, so how do you do it with your kids and still maintain an actual physical shop? Because I know that there are a lot of moms that would like to do that, but, you know, yeah. how, how do you do it? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, to be honest, I don't do it. I mean, I have, a, you know, my studio space, but I don't, I don't have a retail shop. That, to me, okay. is just so scary because that's, you know, you have accountability 24-7. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, since the girls were, I have two girls, um, and they, you know, the you know, they come first, you know, I didn't have children mm -hmm. so that someone else can raise them. That said, though, I have so much help. I mean, I have a babysitter that comes in and my parents come and, you know, my husband, when I fly mm -hmm. to Craftsy and shoot videos for a week so that they can be, you know, brought to other people. Um, you know, my mother-in-law flies in from the mm -hmm. West Coast to New York. Um, so really, I mean, it's such a... I guess traditional answer, but it's really, it, you know, it takes a village and yeah. um, the fact that we have the support from all of our family and, you know, being able to be in my daughter's lives and, you know, being able to walk them to school, but then also being able to run home and have a conference call with you. Yeah. This. So, <laughs> Um, you know, and, and also a lot of nights I work, you know, as soon as the girls go to bed, mm -hmm. which of course is always later than I want it to be, um, you know, I'm back working, you know, whether it's answering emails or with the crafty classes, one of the things I love about it is after you buy the class, you own it for life. So mm -hmm. as a mom, I watch crafty classes because you know, you can watch it whenever you want, mm -hmm. wherever you mm -hmm. want, and that's also my time. I usually, if anyone's written to me, they know I usually get back to them at night or first thing in the morning because I answer all my students' questions, which is really nice. So, um, you know, I think it's it's such a cliche, right? Like, nothing's ever perfect, and, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're all just juggling a lot of balls. Yes, I totally understand that and get that, and I agree with the village thing because I, I know I've had my mom come and and watch my kids plenty of times because of you know the same thing going to, you know, teach a class or judge a competition or you know, uh, all of that, all of that. So, all right, well let's go ahead and get right into the meat of things. We are going to uh, talk about it's. This is actually your crafty video that has just come out. Right, oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we've got you're you're actually going to talk about your this is like your signature thing. I think uh, you have you have a, a video out on YouTube 
that has you making yeah. a, a dog cake. And I, I don't know of any cake decorator that has not seen that. <laughs> if oh, you haven't yeah. seen it, go find it. <laughs> because It's so much fun. Yeah, you know, it started as my dad, which we always joke. Um, it's his favorite child, his dog, Joey. Um, and for his 60th birthday, I could not think of anything else that would be better to make. So at the time I thought, oh, let me make the cake, but also let me videotape it. So we videotaped it. This is back in my old um, bakery space. And then I had a friend who edited it down for me. Um, and it was, I mean, I had no idea how, but yeah, now it, um, it's kind of weird because on my channel it has over 2 million hits, but on another person's oh. channel it has almost 3 million hits. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, a lot of people have watched it. It, um, and so it's kind of nice because from that, then, you know, taking this course, I've had so many questions over the years. How do you actually make yeah. it? Um, yeah. So it's really nice. And also the difference is, you know, now obviously I've gotten better, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a few years later. And also being able for people to customize their dog. So yeah. whether you have a husky or a chihuahua or a Dalmatian. Um, you know, we talk about that in the Craftsy class, how to make, you know, because people really love their animals. Yes, and yeah. I was also <laughs> saying um, it's, you know, teaching the dog is great, but as any cake decorator knows, you always want to build on your knowledge. So I had a student come from England just two weeks before I shot the Craftsy video. She wanted to make Cookie Monster. So I was using the same fur silicone mat that I used on the dog, and I couldn't believe you know, the old me would have used a scalpel and cut every little hair. But so now I realize other ways that I can use my tools. Very cool. Awesome. Well, and so we're going to go through the, your, the process of making this dog. Oh, yeah. um, of course, it's in more detail and a lot more information on Crafty. But this is, you know, this is how, how you do it. And so, okay. So yeah. here we go. This is uh, the the start of it, and I, you know what, I will just let you talk th talk through it. And, okay, sure. Yeah. I mean, people always ask because you know what I do is usually considered realism, and so no matter what I'm doing, whether I'm doing a dog, a handbag, a you know Pinocchio, um, I usually start with blocks of cake. So I I always compare it to like an ice sculpture. So here are just the you know I have the base that's cut out and. Um, on the Craftsy platform, you get the template of the exact shape of a dog's base. You know, the, the dog I did anyway, and it, it teaches you how. But here, so you'll see the first kind of tier, um, because, you know, when you look at a wedding cake, you have tiers, and they usually are graduated like that. Mm -hmm. So now we have to think about, you know, tears within the cake and doweling inside the cake, all these special techniques. So um, this is kind of the first tier, and if you see, I did it at a little angle um, just to start the curvature of the spine. Okay, perfect. And I see down down at the bottom you've got uh, your foam, foam core. core. Yeah, foam and core. Is it, yeah. is it already cut to the shape that, that yes. the base will be? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, early on in my career I used to you know, start the cake on a board, and then after I sculpted the cake, then I would cut the board, and it just made a mess. So now I'm just much better about planning. Good. Awesome. Okay, let's go on with... So after you've got all of your cakes stacked and doweled, yeah. Make sure that you've got really good support in there, right? Yes, yep, and I show how to dowel it and put separator board. And the most important thing I'd say is so many students come to me and they say, oh, my cake was wobbling while I was carving it. And it's so funny because to me it's like, you know, a no-brainer. And it's one of those things like I do every day. But freeze the cake. You stack the cake and then you freeze it before you carve it. You know, you wouldn't try to carve an ice sculpture or a block of ice while it was melting. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing here. Remember, you want your cake to be moist. You want your buttercream to be delicious. So all of those things should be soft when people eat them, but while you're carving them, you want to work with them cold. Yes, very, very good. <laughs> I, it's It really is next to impossible to do something if it's really, you know, make sure you've got enough 
refrigerator or freezer space, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, or as, freeze as cold it. As you can get. Yeah, you could freeze it in portions like That's those true. Tiers, true. and then put it together and then you know, you mm -hmm. have to work quickly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I find that if I'm not working quickly enough, just throw it back in and That's right. Mhm. Mm yeah. Come back later. <laughs> yeah, and so here for the dog, I actually carve the body separately, and here's the head. I always say it looks kind of like a skull or Darth Vader, um, but so the, <laughs> yeah. So the the body's on a separate board, and then the head's on a separate board, and then after they're covered in the fondant, I bring it all back together. Okay, cool. And so I'm sure that you have uh, probably on your crafty video different ways to to shape the face? Is there a difference in the face or is it all just pretty standard? No, of course, you know, if you have a chihuahua, I would say, you know, it's probably more like a heart shaped, like almost more like a triangle um, or an upside down triangle. Um, it's really about looking at each dog and, you know, figuring out the shape, you know, if you're doing uh, a husky, then you may want to elongate the nose a little bit or, you know, a Great Dane, something like that. So, and that would just be the board. Again, I give the templates to the board um, oh, on the head, but, um, you know, you could definitely make differences throughout. So, yeah. All right. I, was it a challenge coming up with templates and things like that for something that's, you know, sculpted and three-dimensional? I can imagine that would have been a little tough to to come yeah, up with a way you know, to teach that. I think in the olden days, I used to make things so difficult for myself. I would, you know, sketch it out, and then I would, you know, hold it up, and then start carving, and then say, oh, say, that's not right. But now it's so nice with all these computers and things, and, and not really computers. I'm so old-fashioned, and, you know, my husband would laugh at me and my brother to hear me talk about computers because I'm so not good with it. <laughs> but, um, but really just taking a photograph of whatever you want to do, whether it's a dog. And now with Google, you know, images, you can get anything. I mean, if a client comes to me and they want me to create a character, I'm able to get you know, usually 360 degrees of whatever it is I want. And then I take that just to a copy store, whether it's Staples or the local copy guy, um, and then I just blow it up to the size that I want. So using the templates is great, and then the kind of like the base templates, I'm just always looking at the cake from an aerial view. All right. So, so you probably get just shots of, you know, different angles of mm -hmm. the of the project. Yeah. And I'm sure that helps. Well, okay. it's nice too because the comments that came from my Craftsy students have just been that it's so nice being taught how to make this template and then being able to make anything, whether it was, mm -hmm. you know, in my handbag class or the dog. I hate for people to feel like when I'm teaching, I'm teaching one thing. One thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I always like to be like, here, I'm teaching you how to make a dog, but this will teach you how to make a cat, a lion, any dog, a cookie monster, you know, that it, it should be giving you the tools and techniques to make any cake you want. Awesome. That's, you know, that's what we're, that's what we need to do because we are custom, right? You know, and so to, to be able to take something from, you know, I, this dog to something totally different uh, yeah, and, just, and be able to change it according to what people are asking for. That's that's really mm -hmm. important because we're not all going to be doing the same exact thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. All right, so this is showing different ways of yeah. doing fur. Is that? Yes, doing different fur. Um, yeah, just using first. I use uh, usually I use an impression mat. So whether it's you know something with straight hair or curly hair or long fur, short fur, um, or pebbly skin. You know something that looks almost like goosebumps um, for the hairless crested dog. Um, and then I, my mom's always loved sharp aid. Sharp eye dogs. Um, so, you know, like making wrinkles and things mm -hmm. like that. So, that was a lot of fun playing with, you know, the different dusts and paints and textures and things like that. 
So, so do you have a texture mat for each of these different types? Do you have multiple texture mats? Um, I do, hmm. although, you know, depending on what I'm doing, I mean, sometimes it's just using something like drawer liner that I have laying around the house, um, or I have, you know, for the fur, I have one now um, that it was so helpful. Otherwise, again, I'm using my hands to make every little hair because, of course, it has to look mm -hmm. perfect. So, yeah, I have um, different mats for that, for the long hair, short hair, um, for the goosebumps, and what's so nice about about them is that they work for so many other things you know like yeah. someone was asking me in the handbag class they wanted to make kind of like a zebra print well if you want it to look like zebra or pony or some sort of animal you could use that mm -hmm. same fur mat for that or you know if uh, two-year-olds love Elmo and they want an Elmo cake just like the cookie monster you can use it for that versus you know everyone can do the piping with either the grass tip or, mm -hmm. you know, just pulling it out, which, you know, it looks cute, and that's fine if that's what you want to do. But if you want to make it out of fondant and you want it to really look real, whether it's like a little teddy bear cookie or, you know, life-size Elmo, then um, I think, you know, the silicone mats really do the best job. Awesome. Okay, and I know that we're going to get a lot of questions in here about where do you get these silicone mats. Okay, um, well, the company that makes them is Marvelous Molds. Okay. Marlin, I could, you know, send the link um, to anyone. I think I have it on my Facebook page. I put it. Um, and the, uh, Dominic is amazing. He's the one who, he's taught so many people how to make your own molds. That's, I think, the parent mm -hmm. company. Um, and now he's gone ahead and worked with different designers for lace molds and you know, these kinds of things. Button okay. molds, jewel molds, he uses things for isomalt, so chocolate, you can, I mean, that's the nice thing about the silicone, like, you know, in this, with the dogs anyway, I'm making legs, and so I could wrap the silicone around the legs, whereas when you, you know, have a hard mat, like I've had, you know, those plastic mats before, you can't wrap it around anything. So working, you know, on a curved surface like a basketball, these are much better. Cool. So when you put on your texture, oh, I, I think we're going to show some pictures of that. Okay. So here's, here's your, your dog oh, yeah. and you're wrapping the fondant around. Well, and this is a great technique. Anyone that's done a more vertical cake um, knows that, you know, if you're covering a beer bottle, you're not going over the top of the cake. Aside from it being too tall, mm -hmm. you're going to crush, you know, the top, especially if you're making all out of cake. Um, and I first started using this technique. I remember there was an art collector who had a lot of Andy Warhol prints of Campbell soup cans. So mm -hmm. I had to make these huge soup cans, one at each end of the buffet for his you know birthday party um, and so I started you know wrapping the fondant around the cake versus over the top and now it's just come in such handy you know because it's not the same like in the handbag I piece it because it's clear it's like a box but on a dog you, you don't want to piece it so this is mm -hmm. a really great technique for doing anything that's super vertical very cool so when when you do this um, do you find that there are seams when you get to the end? Is it um, the, the brand of fondant that you use that helps that, or is there a technique that you do to, to blend it in really well? What, what do you do to yeah. it? Yeah, well, two blend? things. Um, for, these, for this dog cake, um, and actually for the handbag too, I have just started using Fonderific, which I have to say I was really pleasantly surprised. Um, I never, I had never used it before. Um, I started doing it, but for these types of cakes where I want the seams to be gone, um, it's been really great. I've used all sorts of different fondants, and I use different gum paste and stuff like that. But um, so I do think part of it is the fonderific, um, and then also just the technique I show, which is really just keeping my knife beveled when I cut it, and then pushing the silicone mat back over the seam. I think it's really mm -hmm. important when people have seams that they either embrace it. So if you're doing a wedding dress or a handbag where you want the seam to come together, you know, make the seam and make it look like you're creating a seam. So make it perfect, add stitching, put in buttons. But if you're doing something more organic, 
like a mountain or a dog um, and you want to hide it, then don't make a seam straight down the animal, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. Try to do it on a curve, kind of like the motion of the fur. And okay. then you'll see, I actually, I think I sent you a picture of the back of the dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can really see the seam, right? I, I didn't notice the seam, so... Yeah, well now, oh, yeah. of course, now I'll now get... Now we'll be looking. <laughs> emails, I see the seam! You know, it's like my daughter saying, so. anyway, but um, anyway, well hopefully you don't see the seam. I <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure that we won't. That's... And, if you, and if you do, it's fur, so you can always add mm -hmm. a little bit more to cover it over. So, there you go. There yeah. you go. Well, that, those are really great tips of you know making it you know more organic and not straight lines. Um, you know, and the Fonderific is a really great fondant. I have used it, and it is wonderful stuff. So, yeah. and it tastes I, good too. It does. It's really yummy. <laughs> yeah, I love their different flavors too. I like that. Yeah. So okay, so this is the head. Yeah, and so one thing I didn't say before, but I always say, you know, in all the sculpting courses to all my students is you always want to carve deeper than you think you'll need. And and the, the example I always give is with a golf course. So, you know, if you're making little divots and you make a little divot, once the buttercream goes on and the rolled fondant, you're not going to see much of a divot or a sand trap or, mm -hmm. you know, a watering hole. So, um, and the same thing goes if you notice how deep the eyes were carved and how deep the snout and the mouth were carved, um, that was all very intentional because remember you always have to go back over it with the buttercream and the fondant um, mm -hmm. and so if you want those impressions whether you know you're doing a shirt or a suitcase where you want to show a pleat or you know something else, um, just always carve more than you think. Awesome. Well, okay, so I can see the the lines and everything, the texturing. Mm -hmm. This is the texturing mat that you've used for this? Yeah, and so, yeah, so in both this and also the handbag, I use an alligator mat, which is really cool, or I have an ostrich mat, you know, whatever texture I want to do. Um, I actually emboss it first before I put the fondant on, and then um, I can always go back again because it's silicone. I have one here, so, oh yeah, so since it's silicone, I can, you know, just take a corner of it and let's say go in the snout or go in, you know, behind the neck or whatever it is. So it's really nice um, being able to just manipulate it that way. That's really awesome. I, I really like that that mat because you know I've done I've done a dog before and yes you I watched have? your video before I did it. <laughs> let's see, let's see. You have to show. Oh, I don't have a picture of it right now. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I. But it was you know it was really time consuming to you know mark all yes, that fur in yeah. there. It took a long well, time. Well, and even yeah, even the monster cake that I did, um, it's on the cover of my kids' book. I mean, I would never do that again. <laughs> Now that I have the mat, I just don't know why I didn't think of it sooner, but, you know, we keep growing, and, you know, some of my students are always embarrassed to do that. I said, you know, I'm not showing you my cakes from 20 years ago when I first started, so, you know, we we evolve, and that's the uh -huh. point of it. You know, I consider myself still a student, constantly learning, so, um, yeah. you know, when, when you think you know everything, that that's a sad state of affairs. Yes, that means that you're not, uh, you're not, you're not, you don't know everything. <laughs> if you yeah, think you know yeah, everything, yeah. you absolutely don't. <laughs> I always yeah. say, the, the older I get, the more I realize what I don't know. Yeah, I, oh, I, that is so true. <laughs> so true. Okay, so then we have, let's see. And here you, you're putting it all together. Oh yeah, so I doweled right, I doweled the head to the body. Um, and then I did put 
some fur around the neck to seam it. And then there are, there are so many ways you could hide, you know, the seam if you weren't, if you didn't want to go back in and put more fur or anything. Um, you know, so I do a collar. Um, you could also do a bandana or, you know, a big gorgeous flower or a wreath or something. You know, there's there's a big bow. There are just so many ways you could hide seams if you wanted to. Um, but in this one, I actually go ahead and put a dog tag with the dog's name, and I show how to do the lettering and everything, like to make it look embossed, like a real metal dog tag. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but yeah, that's me just you know making the nails and um, I guess putting the legs on and all that stuff. Okay. Do you feel like you need to come in with like a Dresden tool and add more texture to the fur or does that mold do it all for you? Um, I, I think, it, I mean, it definitely can do it all, especially if you think of, I mean, it's not my style and nothing against it, but a lot of people will just cover a cake in fondant, even if it is like an organic cake, like a dog, and they'll airbrush it. And that looks mm -hmm. cool. It just looks cartoonish. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you did nothing and you don't have the mat, you can, it will still read as dog. It will just read as a cartoon character dog, you know, like Garfield or something. Um, but if you wanted to, then I think the, the fur mat is your best bet. And then I usually use the tool, you know, again, to make kind of like the impressions of the paws um, or, you know, to get a little deeper into the eyes, mm -hmm. things like that. And then okay. wherever I seam it together, I usually do do press the mat in first so it has like this general coating of the fur and that the fur is going in the same direction and then I may just go back in with the tool. Awesome. Okay. And it's just a simple, you know, Oops. a veining tool or, um, yeah, and there you see the collar. For the collar there I used just some drawer liner to create like a waffly woven texture. Oh, that's really cool. I mean, and again, it's just a little detail, but I didn't even dust it. I I don't even know if I put stitching. I think I put a little. St I always put stitching, but um, <laughs> well, anything that's textile, you know, you yeah, want I you want the stitching in there. Yeah, right? I can't I can't help myself. Um, and there, I think I'm just showing how I curl the back of it, and then I go ahead and put a D ring and things like that. So yeah, very cool. Very cool, and you can see the details in the mouth and everything, and how and how deep that had to be in order to get the tongue in there. Yeah, and all that. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just love. I add the tongue. Most of my dogs have their mouths open, um, honestly, because it just adds an extra color. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. a whole dog is usually one color or two mm -hmm. tone or three tone, but then you just need a pop of something around there. So um, the eyes mm -hmm. are usually black and brown and white. Everything's always black, brown, and white. Um, so I just usually add the tongue for some color. I love it. Well, and it looks so much more realistic to see their little tongue because, you know, dogs are always, <laughs> you know, yeah. sticking their tongues so out. They cool, right? They, they pant. They cool themselves that way. Exactly. Exactly. I love this. I His, uh, and his little nose, the snout, that's yeah. very yeah, well done. I, you know, I go back in with some dust and stuff like that. And I left the, the chest white. You know, you can go crazy all over, but... I only yeah. had a, a week. <laughs> so do you do you just dust the the fur, or do you airbrush and dust, or do you what what do you do there? You know, I'm not a huge airbrush person. Um, I've used the airbrush on occasion, and usually I'm using it when I'm doing really huge projects. So you know, like the Food Network Extreme Cake when I had a six foot tall sock monkey. Okay. Uh -huh. I had time restraints and I had large surface area to cover. So for that I use the airbrush. But I really like the subtlety of dust. I feel like that, you know, if you're going to look at a real dog's fur, you know, within a two inch block, you may see three different shades of the fur, you know, the darkness, and, and you can really get that with dust. So I do that. Um, I don't seal it in. Some people have been asking me, do I, you know, do I um, steam it or steam it or you know, do anything to seal it? I don't. Um, but you could. Yeah. All right.
Okay, and then let's see. This is your finished dog oh, yay, right here. Doggy. Yay! Yeah. Awesome. And you can see where you've added, you know, darker and yeah, you know, and and not added some color so that you know it, it adds that you know real dimension. The everything. depth, yeah. Like even if you look at like the neck, which is usually you know if you even don't look too close, but look at my own face, you know, the neck is usually in shadow, and then you have the ears that are lighter and so that mm -hmm. just creates more depth than you would normally have and you know that's a good or like in the hind legs or anything like that so mm -hmm. yeah I guess that's where like a picture would come in really handy to see where those shadows are and see where you know the yeah. light would be hitting something mm -hmm. so, yeah awesome and I, I think that's a, a real crucial part of making something look realistic you know you can get the colors right you know, like on a like for one of the Dalmatians that you you show in your crafty mm -hmm. class. You know, you can get those spots just right, but you still have to add that. You know, a little oh, bit of shading. Oh sure. There. Yeah, I remember the first time I decided to make sushi. I remember going to the. I don't even think I ate sushi at the time, and I went to the local grocery store and just bought you know the cheapest sushi I could just one of those little <laughs> containers that uh -huh. you know looks like it's been sitting there for a week <laughs> but you know it's like you know what my wasabi looked like real wasabi because I had it in front of me so um you know, I always say I don't know how cake designers did things before the internet, and I do know because I worked for one, um, and she had like a file folder of all of her, you know, <laughs> cakes and designs, and it's kind of like even to this day, I go through magazines and I tear sheet, you know, if I see something mm -hmm. that I love and I'm like, oh, that would make a great cake. I don't wait to just see everything online, you know, but then I may use um, images to help me get the back or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Details, awesome. things like that. Yeah. Okay, so we, here's the back part that we oh, were yeah. talking about. <gasps> what do you think? I don't see a seam. I'm looking. Well, and also, I mean, where the legs... <laughs> where the legs go in the front of the chest, if people look at that picture again, um, you know, that was all seen mm -hmm. together. So, yeah, I mean, it's really, the Fonderific mm. is just um, amazing. And also I do go back in areas sometimes and add, you know, the silicone mat, and then I also add some extra fondant. I mean, the tail was pieced back on. So um, the ears are pieced on. So you know it's mm -hmm. you can't make it all in one fail swoop. There's no mold. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Not for something that big, for sure. No. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, th this is a really fun project. Um, and it's yeah. fun. The the base is actually a technique. Of, I'm sure most of. Um, your viewers know uh, inlaid fondant, which mm -hmm. is a fun technique, and also just the tiling of it all. And that's being shown. I'm actually Craftsy's releasing a free video for everyone, so it'll be on YouTube. Anyone can watch it, and it's all about the basics of fondant. Um, I think it's not out till June. I heard mm -hmm. like the middle of June. Um, people can check out my Facebook page, or you know the Craftsy website to see when, but it's really cool because I just go through, you know, how to flavor fondant, how to color fondant, how to make a basic rose, you know, really basic stuff, but then we get into, you know, appliques and the silicone molds and also the inlay technique, which is really nice because it looks almost like Spanish tile. That's really cool, and that's exciting that, you know, something free for everybody to watch. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, oh, so yeah. on to your recipe. <laughs> Yum. I, I was really excited to see this because for me, I I don't know, I haven't tried to make brownies very many times, but when I have, I haven't had very much success. And I think, you know, I I know all about, you know, technique and the science sure. behind the ingredients and all that kind of stuff, yeah. but I've just never really taking the time to find a good brownie recipe. So <laughs> oh, well, I hope you like them. Um, it started out as a recipe from pastry school um, and they're definitely more fudgy brownies than cakey. Love that. Um, so just people should be warned. They're awesome with like, you know, brownie, hot fudge sundae. Um, and it's really just about the chocolate. Um, and mm -hmm. what I love about the recipe, it's basically, you know, it's not a one pot recipe, but 
it's it's basically you know there's not a lot of technique involved as long as you mix everything together you're, you're fine awesome. um it could be actually a one pot if you i have made these where i don't have a mixer so you know obviously just soften your butter ahead of time which you should do anyway when you're baking but uh -huh. um anyway it's it's just a great recipe and it, they're super rich and just use good chocolate you know okay do you have a favorite brand? Um, you know, if I just go to the grocery store, I'll use anything from, you know, Ghirardelli um, or Lint or, um, you know, something like that. I'm, I, you know, not a fan of, like, the real, real basic brand. I always say, like, uh -huh. look at it. You know, if it looks really light and gray, that's probably not a good chocolate. If it's really dark <laughs> and rich, then that's... Uh -huh. Um, and then, you know, in my, for my own purposes in the bakery, obviously we could get wholesale stuff. So I use Coco Berry mm -hmm. and Calibo and Valrona. So, um, you know, but I, you can't find that the regular grocery store. Yeah. You have to special order that. <laughs> yeah, you, could, you, you know, even Nestle is totally fine. I mean, it's easier to melt chocolate that's already broken up into chips or again, we get pistoles. We're very fancy, um, you know, the French. But um, anyway, but just any kind of really good quality chocolate chips is good. Perfect. Awesome. Well, and here is the whole um, the method of how to do it. Yeah, and make so. sure you use dark brown sugar. That really adds the depth of mm. flavor versus the light brown sugar. That more, you know, yeah, molasses but type of again, flavor. If you need to make them tonight and the kids are asleep and you can't leave them and you shouldn't, although I know people <laughs> you, know, um, you you can go ahead and use light brown sugar if that's all you have. It'll just mm -hmm. give you a richer flavor. That's all. Okay, awesome. And we have um, the rest of it here. And for those of you that are really wanting the recipe, I will be posting it on our Cake Food blog later Wait. on. And uh, yeah, you can find it there also. But there's also the replay that will be available later on for you guys that uh, want to go through and watch this over again. Um, let's see. Uh, and then some, some tips right here that you can actually freeze the brownies or freeze it before you cut it. I love that tip. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Because otherwise they're so fudgy. Um, so it'll just make your life easy, you know, freeze them overnight or even just stick them in the fridge. Uh, and then take them out. If they're in the fridge, you could take them out, start cutting. If they're in the freezer, let them, you know, warm up for 10 to 15 minutes. And then I usually use a ruler and, a, you know, just a regular chef's knife. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just so I don't run out. But you could just do it by eye. <laughs> I think I was scarred by pastry school. I got yelled out by a chef because I didn't measure my brownies, which is kind of <laughs> They have but, to be uniform and perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't realize, but I guess when you're serving, you know, uh, at an event, it should be. But I learned yeah, the hard way. True. I'll never forget that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I guess the benefits of, of pastry school, right? Yeah, it's like yet another benefit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we have a whole bunch of questions. I know we won't get to them all, and I apologize ahead of time for that, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, um, let's see. Let's find some of these. Sorry, it might take me a second. Let's see. Oh, wow. That's kind of a, a really broad question. Uh, we have okay. someone ask, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do the best you can. Uh, okay, so a quick answer for this. Where should I start a good cake, or start to be a good cake decorator? I love art. I would just pick up some cake decorating books, um, and you're lucky, I'll, I'll I'll say my age by, you know, I didn't have videos <laughs> to watch when I started, um, but, you know, go on to YouTube. I mean, there's so many websites mm -hmm. now. Um, I would just make sure you get a good one. Um, you know, you don't want to learn from someone who doesn't know, but, you know, learning the basics, it's great to 
either look at books and if there's a local you know class it could just be a one-time class at you know a craft store um, you know a local Y or JCC or something like that or a local culinary school like I know our culinary school um, ICE the Institute of Culinary Education and also the French Culinary Institute in New York they sometimes have some just basic you know, cake decorating 101, and then you need to just, I mean, as an artist, it sounds like the person will, you know, be a natural, that maybe they just need help learning how to bake and split a cake, um, mm -hmm. but you can really do so much to teach yourself. I think, you know, the, the more you could teach yourself at home first, and then use the lessons and the expertise to kind of get you to the next level. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you there. Um, okay, so this was a three-part question. I think I'm really going to ask one of them. Um, how far in advance of an order do you bake the cakes for your sculptures and your elaborate designs? Well, when I was running the bakery and I was doing cakes every week, so it was sort of our week was Monday through Saturday, sometimes Sunday. Remember, mm -hmm. small business owner. Um, so, you know, we would start on Monday, Tuesday, kind of baking the cakes, getting them you know, frozen, making the filling, starting on the sugar decorations. Because um, there is this um, fallacy out there that it's not good to freeze your cakes. I agree that you should not freeze your cakes for months or even weeks. Um, but to freeze your cake at the beginning of a week for an order that's ready for Saturday or Friday, um, it's kind of a necessity because when you're putting out 10 cakes in a week, like we were doing running the bakery, there's no possible way you can bake them all that day. And honestly, yeah. I think that, um, you know, to put your cake in a refrigerator, it actually draws out the moisture and kind of dries out your cake. Whereas you, if you wrap your cakes well and freeze them, then um, the flavor actually has time to mature. So whether, you know, it's our banana cake or our chocolate cake, I think the flavor comes out better day two and three. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with that, actually. I, I think that it's... I, I, so Some people are so... Uh, I don't know if it's things that they've read. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's things that they've read about, you know, just, things being yeah, fresh. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I've had, you know, brides that have come to me and think, like, we bake, split, fill, decorate their wedding cake the day that they get married. I want to yeah. say, how would we possibly do that? Yeah, <laughs> There's exactly. no possible way. Mm -hmm. We would be selling one cake per day, if that. I don't even know that you could get a six-tier wedding cake done. You know? mm. But, um, yeah, I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of bad bakeries and bad cake designers. And so if you've tasted a frozen burn cake, you know it's the worst thing in the world. At least to me it is. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, so people are afraid of that. But... You know, I'm not a bakery that bakes my cakes once a year. I'm just saying at the beginning of the week, you uh -huh. know, sometimes two weeks, you can do it. So, and it also depends on the cake. You know, how much fat is in it, how many, if it's oil versus butter. I mean, there are a lot of intricacies to it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, we have someone asking about uh, the, the, the type of cake. So the... Um, yeah. What, what's the perfect cake for sculpting, she asked. And then also she asked about... Um, buttercream for uh, a warm, hot climate. Uh, so, yes. so yeah. um, well, for the cake, I I mean, I use a whole bunch of cakes. I mean, I have vanilla, chocolate, banana, red velvet, carrot. Um, I think you know when you sculpt cake, you want to make sure that it's a fairly firm cake when it's frozen, um, so that it holds its shape and that it's not something you know one of um, my early on, before I had a business, I made a cake out of my carrot cake recipe, which has now changed, but it had, you know, pineapple juice and raisins and shredded carrot, chunky stuff, you know, not good to sculpt cakes out of. So if you're doing something like an apple spice cake, you just want to make sure you dice up your apples really well or your banana. You don't want chunks of things sticking mm -hmm. out, um, and you don't want a cake to break. So, um, you know, my cakes, I would still say, are delicious and moist, but I would say it, they have a tighter crumb. So it's much better to do that with sculpted cake than, for example, using a cake mix, which I'm not against at all. And now that I'm a mom, I'm really not against them. <laughs> um, 
I couldn't do it because of what I do, but um, but I do it, you know, when I'm with my family uh, on a vacation. We make, you know, mixed stuff all the time. But, um, you know, that, that those kinds of cakes are so spongy that I'm afraid they would break mm -hmm. if trying to carve it. Um, and then in terms of the buttercream, um, you know, you shouldn't be building your cake in hot, hot, hot weather. So, you know, I've had a lot of students from... Um, Costa Rica and hey I live in New York City nothing's more humid in August um, than this island but um, you know so using a ganache is always a good idea um, and then just always work if you can you know get an air conditioner get a fan don't don't build your cake in hot 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 weather yeah yeah that's I think that's a, a key to to making sure that, and you know, if it starts to get soft, throw it in the fridge yes. or in the freezer. Yeah, yeah. Just constantly, just... you know, yeah. If you're working mm -hmm. from home, just clear out your fridge and, you know, make room for your cake. And if you're taking it to an event where they want it outside, uh, tell them yeah. either just no, or if they yeah. do, say, Look, I'm, I'm not know, responsible. For what happens if you leave yeah, this out? Exactly. In the I mean, you know, one of my famous stories is I did a Victorian house cake. It was banana cake with chocolate buttercream in August, complete replica of the Victorian house, down to the paint chips. And a week before, the mother told me it was going to be in a tent without air conditioning. And I said, No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just increased. So I made her switch from chocolate buttercream to chocolate ganache to make it more stable. And we sent it in a refrigerated van, and the van sat there until the start of the party. So it wasn't, you know, the cake wasn't sitting out for hours before they started the wedding. And, you know, people really have to understand. I've seen, you know, decorations slide down the side of buttercream cakes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of bakeries here who will not do buttercream wedding cakes in, you know, the months of June, July, August. It's just mm -hmm. too risky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. We have someone that asks about, um, uh, this is a really good question for someone that's a beginner. Um, they, they're wondering what kind of cake sculpture is a good one to start on. Is, is this one that they could do as a beginner? I would say um, this has a lot of piecing, like separate pieces and the head and the body. So um, I would say a beginner could do it, although I would probably say to start with something that's like probably more square, so something more mm -hmm. like a handbag or a doctor's bag or a gym bag or, you know, even a backpack, something that's really mm -hmm. stable and not on an angle, and mm -hmm. then I would say maybe do the dog after. So okay. I would start with a handbag and a smaller cake, just to familiarize yourself with all the steps and stages and then you know as you go on because the dog is a little slanted it has a little bit more intricate doweling than you know just mm -hmm. a typical cake um, and so you know I would always start with just a round cake a square cake and then get into a sculpted cake you know maybe even like a basketball or tennis ball soccer ball something round and then you could get into a more elevated sculpted cake Okay, so I think we can only take one more question. Our, we are running out of time here, and we don't want to keep you too long, Elisa. So, um, okay, I'm here. All right, so let's find a really try and find a really good one. Sorry. Okay, so. Sorry, we're gonna be. Okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, is there, are, are there art classes that uh, you would recommend to help develop, uh, develop my personal cake designs? Yes, I mean I started by saying early on um, I took a color class which I thought was amazing. Um, just anything you do in life, whether it's decorating your house or choosing a car or making cakes, um, color theory is just amazing the relationship of color you'll never look at color the same and values like we were talking about with the dog um, and then the other thing I would just say is drawing you know people get so mm -hmm. scared and especially if you think you're going to do cakes whether it's for your family 
or for clients, um, you know, a lot of clients want to see a sketch and it's a mm. really good way as a professional to kind of protect yourself because if someone says, I want you to make my boat and someone else that is thinking, oh, she's making my boat, but if you guys have a totally different boat in mind or so, you know, it's, it's just really good. Um, I usually send my clients a sketch. Um, sometimes cakes are much more abstract, you know, like, I want a ring of daisies on my cake, on my square cake. You know, a square cake that's four inches high looks very different than a square cake that's two inches high mm -hmm. and, you know, the width and stuff. So drawing and sketching is a great tool to have really whatever you're doing in life. Awesome. So find some, some uh, art classes that... Yeah, the I mean, really, I think that any class you take would be really helpful. any. Yeah. Oh, it's you know, you could take a paper making class, and I mean, walking in the streets, like I always say, you know, architecture and fabrics, and you know, I mean, you can really doing anything is going to help your cakes. But for specific classes, I think you know, drawing is probably better than painting. But yet, if you're mm -hmm. an amazing artist and you know how to draw, but you're not good at relationships with color, then painting could be good for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. especially painting with gels, if you want to explore that more. Or I just took, um, like about a few weeks ago, I took a polymer clay workshop because oh, my cool. mom was hosting it at her house. And I didn't even know, you know, I knew what Fimo dough was, but I didn't even know about caning and all this stuff. I loved it. It was just like working with fondant and uh -huh. sugar doughs. Um, you know, my mom was very impressed. I had perfect checkerboard design. So anyway, awesome. um, so, you know, <laughs> play, pottery. If you're not sure about sculpting, then take a sculpture class. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for coming, for being a part of everything, and we will... See you all next week. Great. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.